Astonishing Legends Network. Listen to the Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishing legends. We are back. Forrest, hello. say hello to everybody. Please welcome Mr. Ryan Mangini to the stage. I saw an apparition at uh, our ranch growing up, and I see this black being, like blacker than the night itself. Did you feel like under the influence of anything? I felt like I was being attacked. Nobody came out, nobody nope. else, uh, no neighbor nope. saw that. It's almost like people want to believe that they're entangled. Everything's attracted to the light. Even the darkness is attracted to the light. They want to see what's going on. If you are feeling suicidal, thinking about hurting yourself, or concerned that someone you know may be in danger of hurting himself or herself, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. 1-800-273-8255. It is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is staffed by certified crisis response professionals. Astonishing Legends would like to thank BetterHelp, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. In part one of our series about the legend of the body on the moor, we introduced you to an unidentified man found dead along a hiking path outside of Manchester, England in 2015. Local authorities could find no identification on him and had no idea who he was, so they dumped him near Dovestone, after the reservoir near where he'd been found. For 13 months, he remained unidentified, and the investigation into his background led police in a million different potentially promising directions, but they all led to dead ends. But then there was a breakthrough when DNA matched him to a relative. Neil Dovestone was, in fact, a man named David Litton. Or was he? It turns out that once David Litton was identified, his past proved to be more complicated than it was when authorities didn't know his identity. In fact, when the Greenfield Mortuary dubbed him Neil Dovestone, that would be the second time his surname had been changed since he was born. He'd changed it himself in 1986, from David Lutenberg to David Litton, after a fight with his brother. In his enigmatic past, he'd been a taxi dispatcher, a baker, a train driver for the London Underground, and even a croupier in the wealthy Mayfair area. He'd had a girlfriend that, after their brief relationship, he remained platonic friends with for 40 years before he disappeared from her life in 2006. It was her understanding that he'd sold his house and moved to the United States. But that wasn't true at all. David Litton's narrative is one interwoven with themes of isolation and identity and leaves behind many more questions than answers. His story not only highlights his mysterious existence, but is also a window into the broader human experience of solitude and personal boundaries. Tonight, we'll explore why Mystery Solved is sometimes just a doorway to more questions. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. You never tire of the moor. You cannot think the wonderful secrets which it contains. It is so vast and so barren and so mysterious. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Join us tonight for part two of our two-part series about the mystery of the body on the moor. And we're back. That we are, folks. I I can't believe this is our 290th episode. That's just insane to me. This October will actually be our official 10th anniversary, too. That's also crazy, but we didn't do anything for the 200th episode, anything special. No, we did something for 100. We did Arcapalooza, and then 200, we just tried to pretend it just happened. We'll do something. Yeah. We should do something. Yeah. Well, uh, folks, we're also about to roll something new out. We're excited about that, too. Production has started on it. More on that soon. But by the way, we still have leftover Monster Fest mm. 2024 t-shirts in the store. So get over to astonishinglegends.com and check out our store for that stuff. Once they're gone, they're gone. We're not going to print any more of those. Uh, mm. We're working on a merch refresh for October and also the fall and winter season. So keep an eye on things. More on that too when it actually happens. Oh, and one other quick thing. This summer we did a summer release schedule bundling shows together so we could work on some additional astonishing projects. 
and we're dark the next two weeks, but after that, we're back to our regular bi-weekly year-round schedule until next summer. And one other quick but important note, Apple is making Patreon add a 30% charge for new members who join through their app after November 2024. If Patreon doesn't comply, they'll be kicked out of the App Store. Uh, Yeah, we mentioned this last week, but if you're interested in joining our Patreon, sign up online through a web browser or an Android device rather than through the iOS App Store to Mm. save 30% in fees that Apple is now charging for new members. This has absolutely no effect on existing patrons. That said, we'd love to have you, so if you want access to bonus content, including the astonishing junk drawer and commercial-free versions of the main show, then sign up at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Yes, and uh, there'll be no effect for anybody, again, who's joining through Android or just uh, join on a web browser, Mm -hmm. and you won't have to deal with the App Store iOS fee, Mm -hmm. which is silly. Okay, folks, we've got a great show for you tonight, so let's dive back in. So at the end of part one, and in the cold open tonight, we told you that authorities, after 13 months, figured out who Neil Dovestone was. That's a long, complicated investigation. No people are like, well, you guys, we normally talk about mysteries that never get solved. But <laughs> So it's short in right. terms of astonishing legends. But for a police investigation, 13 months is a long time for what looked like a fairly routine suicide, yeah. really. And the sergeant who was working on it, Coleman, he, he really pulled out all the stops to get to the bottom of this crime, and it's fascinating how it unfolded. Yeah, no, the lead investigator on this for the area, the local constabulatory, and I think the greater uh, police force there, because he went down to the Met and conferred with them. And yeah, we're all familiar, of course, with cold case shows, and like, this case has been open for 30 years, and, and those are complicated as well, but this is nothing like they've ever really come across, even with all their other missing and unidentified person's cases. This one was so strange because there's things that they knew, but it didn't lead them anywhere. It just opened up more questions. And then if you do get to a conclusion, there's even more questions. So that's what we're all about here. It's like the paranormal yeah. in general. People always ask us, do you ever get a sense of what's happening with the paranormal? Do you, do you ever get any answers? And it's like, well, no, but you can ask better questions because you're familiar with the angles on it, but none of it's really satisfying in a way, but you understand it more as you become more sophisticated. So in this case, this is only 2015, folks. So there have been improvements with crime scene investigation and forensics, but it was pretty good back then. And even at their disposal, you're talking not only England, but Pakistan and having to communicate with a country that doesn't do everything. We're going to talk about this podcast from BBC the host asked them like, well, if you had a fingerprint, of course, you have a body, you can get a fingerprint. Does that mean that in Pakistan only they would uh, have that on file if this person committed a crime? And the detective sergeant said, well, no, not exactly. They do it a little differently. In Pakistan, to get to the doctor or get a passport or anything else that you do that's semi-official, get into a hospital, let's say, you have to have your fingerprint and ID card on file. So pretty much anybody who's using services over there, especially of a government nature, has their fingerprint on file and there is still no match. And that's the kind of thing that kept happening to them. It's like, oh, this will lead us somewhere. It's going to be a lot of work, but it'll take us somewhere. And it's like, "Mm, nope, it's a dead end. Exactly. That's a hallmark of this case, I believe, in that there's some tantalizing clues. It's not like he had nothing on them. He had the bottle and it looked like a well-worn cardboard box. We all do this, or at least our folks do, (laughs) that they reuse a box that something came in for other purposes. Just ask my mom about butter tub containers. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) In this case, they had one clue, didn't really lead anywhere other than like, okay, Pakistan, Urdu writing on it. That's something. But it led them nowhere. And they had a plate in his leg. Okay, yes, but still, it didn't give them any solid clues. It just led to more avenues to explore. The thing about the plate was they knew that it was Pakistani produced. And in the postmortem, it had been determined that the surgery was fairly recent, within maybe two years. And they found the company. It's just like in uh, Blade Runner. For those of you old enough to have seen the first one, there were serial numbers on the snake scales, on the robot snake or whatever. They go down, (laughs) zoom in, enhance, enhance or whatever. But they got this information off the plate and they were able to find the company in Pakistan that made the plate, and they found out that they made maybe 500 a year. They went out to 12 or 15 different hospitals. But so they contacted all of them. Right. And they still could not find a surgeon or connect a particular operation 
to this gentleman from the reservoir. Unlike a lot of other plates would take multiple screws, this one had one screw that it would affix to, to the bone, but there was a, an extra screw attached. There's something odd about the way that the operation went and how it was applied. I didn't read about the specifics of the screws, but I did read that it was a particular type of installation of it. Yes. That they felt they could track to a particular surgeon. Right. If they could find that surgeon, because everybody's doing the work a little bit differently, or they have hallmarks of the way they do the operation. But again, that was a dead end. On the other hand, a lot of their records are still on paper, which are very hard to search, especially for uh, somebody outside the country coming in and right. asking for cooperation just to solve this case. And they got some cooperation, but they said, well, you know, there's maybe no record of it, but maybe the surgical team would remember this guy, especially because he's not Pakistani yeah. and that he kind of stood right. out. Uh, he was very tall and thin, obviously a foreigner. And did yeah. we ever find out if he spoke Urdu? No, actually. I, don't, I haven't come across anything that indicated that he did. Me neither. Yeah. But he, he got along. His neighbors in Pakistan said he was a quiet it's man. It's hard to imagine, like, through immersion and living there that he wouldn't have picked up, you know, some, of course. Yeah, I'm sure he did because yeah. people did know him. He had to live somewhere. He was in a neighborhood. He ate and shopped and did everything that every other person does in a neighborhood. So even with that, it was still hard to piece together just who this man was. Because remember, folks, another aspect of this is motive. Why did he do this? Right. Was there foul play? They have to piece that together because it's not just wrapped up if we decide that, well, he took his own life, sadly, but that was the end of it. Is there a crime committed here? Right. And a lot of the good details about this case can be found in a podcast series from the BBC, as we said earlier. So tell us a little bit about that series, Scott. Yeah, so that's a BBC show. It was a great seven-part series. It was produced when all of this was unfolding. So the first six are actually before they figured out who he was, and the seventh one is how they figured out who he was in the end. It's hosted by John Minnell and produced by Emma Rippon, and it also has Martha Carney narrating it. It's really great, so mm. look for that wherever you get your podcast. We'll have links to it in the show notes. Also, all the BBC articles, because there's a lot. There's a lot of articles in The Guardian as well. It's a very well-sourced story because it's a modern story that had so much intrigue. And so we have modern journalism in the mix on this. It's not something that Forrest and I are used to. We've got modern forensics, modern journalism, CCTV. <laughs> right. Normally, we don't get to it. We're talking about the Pied Piper, and it's like, well, yeah. what do you look like? Nobody knows. You know, this yeah. was a long time ago. We actually got some evidence here, which is fascinating. Like a, a modern mystery, you get more to it now. So yeah, we'll have links to all that stuff. Check it out if you want to dive deeper on this. But let's come back to the broken leg. This is pretty interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about how the leg got broken in a minute. But the other thing is in the post-mortem, they had taken, obviously, samples. They had hair yeah. samples from him, and they had bone samples from him. They had some chest hair, and they talk about how they can analyze mm -hmm. this, uh, do an isotope analysis, and see where he'd lived. And of course, you've seen this on TV shows and forensic files and whatever else. It's like the hair is a record of months of right. living. And you can look at it and figure out down to a region where somebody might have lived right. and what they ate and all of that kind of stuff. It's all recorded in your hair. Well, your body absorbs isotopes as you live in an environment. And so that environment is specific to, of course, regions. And uh, what the forensic person said in the interview was that it may not be able to tell you exactly London, but you could say, you know, something like Southeast England. You right. could uh, pinpoint it to a region that, that narrows it down, at least, other than just the subcontinent of Asia. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> but you could, do, you could start there as well. So it's fascinating that as you eat food and drink beverages and are just out in the environment, those all kind of get recorded by your body and stored in your, yeah. your hair, your DNA, uh, your teeth. And as we've seen in some, uh, like a Nova, they'll have uh, investigations of uh, Neanderthal teeth. Neanderthal, yeah. and uh, we'll find out what they were eating. That's from the scrapings on the tooth, but they can run analyses of uh, all the things that you come in contact with in your environment and ingest ends up as a record on your person. So even with that, though, not a whole lot of answers. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Self-care is a term that's bandied about quite a bit these days, and I think we all have an idea of what that is. Maybe you think it's just getting your daily coffee shop beverage, or a mani-pedi, or journaling. And those little things that make you happy can be a part of self-care, as they do help. Like I just heard, you should seek out moments that inspire awe every day. Like check out a sunrise, or sunset, or step outside tonight and look at the moon and stars. 
But what about the bigger self-care activities that you never skip, no matter what? Maybe that's going for a walk or your quiet reading time or your therapy day. Yeah, your non-negotiables. But even when we have our go-to things we love every day that help us keep it together, life's obligations often override them and get in the way of our self-care. Like the kids' back-to-school routines and extracurricular activities and getting back to that early morning schedule. Or those work or home projects piling up. All of these kinds of things make it easy for your priorities to slip away, even if they're things that bring us joy. But as Forrest and I always say, it's like the safety instructions on a flight. You need to put your oxygen mask on first Uh. before helping your loved ones. You need to be in good shape first in order to effectively help others. Yeah, you know, we do say that a lot. Well, well, it's true. It's those times when you feel overwhelmed and have no time for yourself. Your non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. Self-care can just be venting to someone. It does help, and it's a lot more beneficial if that someone is an objective trained professional. A therapist can help you manage those overwhelming feelings and anxiety and and teach you positive coping skills. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash astonishing today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash astonishing. We've recommended the Let's Read podcast before. And we're happy and excited to do it again. And we certainly are, because Let's Read is a great compliment to our show. So if you like what we do here, you're going to enjoy Let's Read, because it's a fresh and super entertaining take on many of the same topics. Yeah, that's right. The Let's Read podcast features a wide array of horror stories, ranging from true crime and paranormal encounters to creepy personal experiences making it a must-listen for fans of the genre. Many of the stories are actually submitted by listeners, providing a diverse and authentic range of terrifying tales that resonate with a broad audience. Hosted by Joel, whose storytelling prowess creates an immersive and chilling listening experience, perfect for fans who love to be on the edge of their seats. Dive into a rich archive of episodes with spine-tingling stories that include everything from haunted houses and ghost sightings to unsettling true crime cases and creepy encounters. Join a vibrant community of horror enthusiasts who engage with the podcast, sharing their own stories and experiences making it an interactive and dynamic show. Stay tuned for special episodes and theme story collections that explore new and exciting facets of horror storytelling. Search for Let's Read on your favorite podcast platform and remember to hit follow so you never miss an episode. This is Rudy Ariza. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. They also ran DNA on them, and they're running, trying to get matches all over the world. And then they came up with this match, and they're like, finally, we've mm-hmm. got something. It was somebody in Slovakia. Right. And they're like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. And then they went to check it again, and it didn't line up. Yeah. It was a false alarm. So the anniversary was coming up, and Detective Sergeant Coleman was like, how can we crack this nut? It's been almost a year. What are we going to do? And one of the things that he had done was asked one of the guys that he was working with to go through all the passenger manifests and look for a British traveler that matched his description traveling alone from Pakistan to London. And that had come up empty the first time, but another person had got put onto it the second time. And that guy went through all the records and he managed to find a person who looked like the right guy. So going through the list of all the people that were flying, this detective who was working with uh, Sergeant Coleman finds a 67-year-old white British male traveling alone on December 10th, 2015 from Lahore, Pakistan to Heathrow. And this description sounds like a match. Turns out it is him. Seat 25C, Pakistan International Airways Flight 757, which was a 777 aircraft. It just happens to be the flight number. Sounds like a plane, but it's not. (laughs) 757 was (laughs) the flight. This flight, I looked it up. It's not still happening. It's been discontinued for quite some time. But you could take this uh, flight, which is like almost, I think, a seven or eight hour flight from Lahore to London. And on that day, on December 10th, 2015, this passenger landed at Heathrow at 3.30 in the afternoon. That was David Litton. So now they know that Neil Dovestone was David Litton. That's the man who flew that day. So once they figured that out, they were like, we've got to find his relatives. They do the normal police investigation. Now they're not stuck in the mud anymore. They can do that kind of standard stuff that lets them get to the bottom of it. And they track down the relatives. They find his mom. Turns out she's suffering from dementia. She lives in a home in London. They do DNA with her, and it's a match. So upon finding his mom, 
they also find out that there's a woman who calls in to check on her every day. Right. And they're like, well, who is that? The home's like, yeah, she calls every day. Who is it? Well, it's Maureen Toogood. T-O-O-G-O-O-D. Right. Great last name. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, decide to investigate and they get in touch with her. It turns out that she had known him for 40 yeah. years and she'd had a relationship with him for 15. And as she said, you know, she was the one calling into the care home every day to talk to his mother. That was very, very sweet of her. She was checking, checking in, in on her every day. Yeah. And she said, this is the first time somebody called me back. She goes, I'm the one doing the calling. Somebody right. called me back about this. And I think the uh, detective on the line said, uh, you know this woman. Do you know any relatives of hers? And that made the connection. She goes, well, I, I do actually. Yeah, I know her son. One right. of them anyway, because he turns out he has a brother too. And what Maureen had said was, well, they met in 1968 when she was, I think, out on the street yeah. or something. She took right. a fall. And she was trying to get up and she heard a man yelling. He's like, no, stay there. I'm coming. I'm going to come help you. And it was him. It was David Litton, our victim. Comes over, helps her up. She describes him as very chivalrous and taking care of her. And then he started calling her the next day after watching after the first day. And, and they had a relationship. They hit it off. And he had been in the area because at this time he was working as a croupier at a some gambling facility near... I think it was in the Mayfair area of London, yes. which is, it's funny because I've I've only been to London once and that's where I stayed. Oh, I stayed in Mayfair. Nice. So I have a sense of this yeah, yeah. part of town. So they actually got married and at some point in their relationship, and I don't know if it was before or after they got married or whatever, but Maureen became pregnant and they were due to have a baby, but unfortunately there was a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And according to her, he was never the same after that. Yeah. He, he became very depressed. And they wound up separating, but they remained friends. They had a platonic relationship and she regularly stopped by and the neighbors even knew her, that his neighbors would say, oh yeah, she came by all the time. She would trim the hedges for him or go to the grocery store and that sort of thing. And he, uh, I actually have a friend like this. He lives in extremely minimalist <laughs> lifestyle. It? Ascetic. Ascetic, right. That's exactly right. That's the word for it. You know one person. This guy, this friend of mine, has made it a lifestyle. <laughs> as long as I've known him, he's lived in essentially one-bedroom apartments, a TV usually on the floor, a bed on the floor, maybe a chair, mm. a guitar, and that's kind of it, and an air conditioner. What's fascinating about it is that now he's a psych nurse. <laughs> he he, he <laughs> yeah. works on wards taking care of people. And I actually asked him about this case. I was like, you know, this guy reminds me of uh, you. Oh, you did. I, I you reached did. out to him on text. Yeah. And I was like, no, no offense, right. but like, just tell me what you think. But what's interesting about this too was, you know, it, to get more specific about this, what Maureen had said about David Litton was that he slept on a piece of foam on the One floor. And a One half and a half inches, inches thick. thick. Yeah. Not like, oh, hey, that's yeah. not so bad. Get a five inch thick uh, piece of foam. You could, you could survive no. on that, especially memory foam or something nice. But no, uh, something that uh, you would still be feeling the floor with. That's horribly uncomfortable. And I guess when she said to him, you know, why don't you get a bed? As long yeah. as she knew him, he never had a bed. And he said to her, I'm not entitled to comfort. Yeah. And she didn't know why he said that. And again, when you look at the psychological analysis and, you know, I talked to my friend about this, we, oh, we talked to Gled about it a little bit and some other folks I asked for insight and, you know, it's an indication. It could be an indication of a lot of things. And I, the first thing I want to say is I'm, I'm not right, a psychologist. Right. We're not, we're not psychiatrists. We don't even play one on TV. That's <laughs> mm. the worst joke ever. I don't know why I made it. But the point is one thing I do know about trying to analyze somebody that you've never met. First of all, we have no qualifications for analyzing anybody. But then on top of that, this is all speculation based on third yeah. hand information about this investigation. So we're not pretending to know what motivated him or didn't no, motivate because him. Because I would just say even Maureen, his partner for all those years, was surprised at yeah. some of the things that she found out later about him. Uh, she had no idea why he would do those things. And you, you think you know someone. Well, David Litton himself uh, was an enigma. And he was. Uh, and, and so that's the other fascinating aspect of this case, just from, uh, you know, we like to analyze personalities as well, especially people who end up in strange situations. You want to know why they did something. This is what I was going to say a second ago, just to finish my thought is like when he said he didn't deserve those comforts or I, I'm not entitled to those, is that an indication of low self esteem? or guilt over something that he had done in the past. It could be either one of those. The guilt thing was something that uh, Glad had suggested being a former uh, detective himself. 
which I thought was interesting. But then the other thing is just being, you know, and we all know people with low self-esteem and some of us have low self-esteem. <laughs> so <laughs> there are people who flog themselves psychologically for that. It's like, yeah, I don't deserve that. It's a self-flagellation kind of deal where you're denying yourself something because you're punishing yourself. A mea culpa of something he may have done in the past or just how he thought. Right. He chose something that is... We said very painful, has the victim or the ingester writhe in agony in a horrible yeah. death. Why choose something that grueling, you know, that torturous? And you know what else? This is 2015. He could have gone into an internet cafe and paid yeah. cash to get online oh. and look at what it would do and how it would work. And, and we would never know because he paid cash for everything he did, you know, for yeah, this trip. Yeah, yeah. He was really good at covering his tracks and being anonymous uh, so much so that I have a certain admiration for him and what he did. I find <laughs> it very intriguing and compelling. Yeah. His ability to be invisible or to make things really confounding is pretty impressive. Well, when you live that simplistic of a lifestyle and keep everything that tidy or minimalist, it's not as hard, you know what I'm saying, to pull in yeah. the antenna and disappear yeah. a little. But as for manners of going out in this world... There are other means that are less painful. Right. Was he punishing himself? Well, that's what if I it wonder. If was a suicide, yeah, that's, that's the question. That's right. what I wonder if it was like, no, I kind of deserve this, or I don't deserve anything less painful, or right. I'm not just going to rent a car and park it in the garage, you know, anything like that. Yeah. It has to be yeah. this location. It has to be what he had in his pocket and at this time, but he was also very secretive. He, he told his neighbors, I think in 2006, one of the neighbors contacted Maureen and they tell her... You know, David sold his house back on October 4th of 2006, and that he was planning on just packing up and going to California. And she, yes. that, that threw her for a loop. She had no idea he was going to be doing that. And she's like, oh, okay. And that was the last time I think she heard about him or heard not really from him, but just heard about him. Yeah. Well, she had been out of touch with him already. And that's when his, yeah, the neighbor had known her because she was always coming by or used to always come by and look in on him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, his house is sold and he's leaving tomorrow yeah. for California. That's what she told Maureen. And to quote a BBC article that this was written by Catherine Westcott in March of 2017. I love this quote. He upped sticks and left the country. <laughs> he pulled up stakes, yeah, I think. That's we what would the journalist, yeah. He upped right. sticks. I like that. Yeah. What Maureen never expected was that instead of going to California, David Litton spontaneously moved to Lahore, Pakistan, mm -hmm. and specifically the neighborhood of Hassan Town. Uh, which is a large neighborhood in Lahore, which I think is the second biggest city in Pakistan. He arrived there on October 6th, 2006. Now, here's another interesting thing. In the investigation, they found that six months after that, he went to Dubai for four days, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. Why Dubai? What did he do while he was there? It's hard to imagine, but then he came back. Right. Because he is a peculiar and quirky personality, it may have just been for no reason at all. Much like people are, <laughs> as the term goes, sadly. Maybe he wanted to see that island that was shaped like a palm tree. Perhaps. There's some nice shopping there. He did uh, have yeah. nice things, not outrageously expensive, but like the Swiss Bally shoes. Yeah. And the nice clothing. His Sunday best, perhaps, to be found in. And right. it's like, why are people, I think younger people, this is a trend, Sitting on a flight and not doing anything? No digital entertainment, not reading, not doing anything, just staring ahead with your eyes open. Yeah. Well, it plays into like all the people like, oh, it's kind of like the Summerton man right. take. It plays into all the people who are like, he's a spy. He's yeah, a spy. Yeah. There's some whole other life going on that we do not understand. Right. We're only seeing the traces of it. And hey, you know what? That's a possibility. There's a possibility exactly. that he had a secret life that we just cannot make sense of. And the secret life may have been just as confounding as his regular right. life because he was a quirky right. guy. And that's one of the things that Maureen said about him. She called him quirky, but precise. Yeah, I'm getting that. that. he had a certain precision There's, to uh, There is some, yeah. you could say, OCD precision to him and, and the way, and the manner yeah. that he carried himself. Unlike uh, aspects of the Summerton Man case, where there were some odd clues as to what he carried in that uh, case. Also, by the way, they never, he had a case with him of Elise a suitcase, something, a traveling bag. They never found that. That's right. So that bag, that bag was 39 pounds. Yeah. 39 pound bag that he left Pakistan with when he went to London. 
and he did not have it when he showed up in Greenfield, right. and no one knows where that is or what was in it. And you know something else that Glad said? Because he was on one of the right. teams that was looking through the CCTV footage for this guy to try to figure out who he was, he said that he noticed when they finally did find him that he had a bulge in his jacket. Yeah, and that's they, right. And they never figured out. He did, was like, I don't know what that was either. Right. And so that was him, you know, with his Scotland Yard hat on. And so we don't know what that was, and we don't know where that bag went. I mean, who knows? He he could have just left it with no tag on it somewhere, and it might have just been full of clothes or something. I mean, who knows? If it was full of money and somebody found it, probably not going to call that in. He could have dropped it at an orphanage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, those kinds of things don't always get reported. No, and he did seem to have cashed out a bit, but people say, well, he he must have known somebody. This man must have family and people that knew him, and he did. And it took a while, a long yeah. time, for them to be found and come forward, or actually they, just to be found. And then he did have yeah. some of that, but it, that still gave no more clues. Right. So I know we've touched on the name change before. I want to come back to it before we get to the end of this show and talk about it again, because it's one of the most fascinating aspects of this case, to me anyway. Him changing his name to Lytton because he had a severe falling out with his brother, is at least how it's told in most of the articles and research we could find. There's no indication what the falling out was about, what they argued about. That's not said anywhere. But it was enough of a thing that David felt that he needed to change his last name. So that was the new surname that he gave himself, mm -hmm. Lytton, L-Y-T-T-O-N. Now, Maureen, his girlfriend, originally knew him as David Keith Lutenberg, L-A-U-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. And that was the original family name, but he had changed it to Lytton because of that argument. But here's the other thing. David's brother, Jeremy, and his mom, Sylvia, who was of Jewish descent and from Poland, they both changed their surnames, too, from Lutenberg to Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N. They did that in 1969. So it's not clear to me exactly when David changed his name. Mm -hmm. I think something had said that it was 1986. But prior to that, my question is, I don't know that it was Lutenberg when he was with Maureen, right. or if the whole family had already changed it to Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N. So then the question becomes, and it's not really, it's a minor detail, but whatever. It's like, did he change it from Lawton to Lytton, or did he change it from Lutenberg to Lytton? I'm not sure there. Right. And I believe he had a falling out with the whole family in some various yeah. ways. He was estranged from them. And that may not seem like a big detail, but it may point a little to some motivations for this action that we'll talk about as we get to our conclusions area, because it may point to one of the reasons why he chose to do what he did in this manner. Family may be a big part of that. Yeah. Not so much friends. He had friendship. He had companionship. But he treated that very oddly, too, in the way that he just kind of snipped that off. But that may go to his personality. But I think something is pointing to some kind of trauma in his life. And it could have been this falling out with his family. A lot of times people are very close to their families, or it could have been a very troublesome family situation, which also left him to decide to cut off ties. Something over perhaps religious background, because as we know, he is from a Jewish family, yet yes. he had a Quran upstairs and one downstairs yes. for reading. He seemed right. to be interested in Pakistani culture. He was also interested in Buddhism, according to right. Maureen. So he, he had a fascination with Islam as well as Buddhism, I guess. He seemed to be searching a little for himself, what he was about, and that may require breaking ties with everything from your past to start afresh or go on a journey of self-discovery. And right. for him, that certainly seemed to mean moving to Pakistan and not keeping in touch with people that he cared about here. That didn't include family. When you say cared about, I mean, you put that in air quotes because it seems like he's okay with writing people off at a certain point, or apparently he did. Actually, he kind of has a trend of writing people off, and I don't mean to put that in a negative light, right. like he's a horrible human being, but he seems like he's okay. Well, I'm closing this chapter. As many of the articles have said, he's compartmentalizing all of these different relationships, and you know, to use a buzzword from pitch decks, mm. he's <laughs> siloing everything. He's siloing yeah. People from each other, people don't necessarily know each other that are from different parts of his life. Right. He didn't have their worlds collide. I know what that's like a little too when you have different types of friends and you don't, uh, yeah, you don't feel comfortable. Yeah, everyone does this. Yeah, you don't feel comfortable with them mingling. So it's not to yes. be cruel, really. You just maybe know that they're not going to get along. Yeah, that's an exact point that I wanted to make. This isn't weird. This doesn't make him a strange guy. Everybody 
does that. Everybody segments their circle of friends. You know, like you just said, you know some people aren't going to play nice together. They Maybe you don't mind them, even though they're really different, but you know that at the ends of that particular triangle of friendship, that the two on the, on the outer points, they're not going to ever agree or get along. You know, that's an interesting thing that folks do, and especially when it comes to, uh, you know, family life, religion, politics, all that kind of stuff. People keep people apart from each other. That's a normal thing, but he seemed to take it to an extreme in terms of really separating these things out and separating phases of his life. The compartmentalizing term is is right. And the, like I said before, the weird thing for me is there's something attractive to me about the way he was managing all this stuff. And I don't know if that's because I have control issues and I'm just impressed with the <laughs> amount of control he was exercising over everything. He's a very ascetic person, as we said before, in that he's, he's yeah. very... Uh, minimalist, bare bones about everything. Right. That may go to, as you said, a self-esteem kind of issue or just keeping things secret. So it follows logically that his ending was so secretive. There's a missing 59 minutes. We don't know still how he got to the pub after leaving the train station. Yeah, because that was 12 miles. You couldn't walk that far in that amount of time. Not in an hour. So, so somehow he got there, but that's still a mystery. And uh, he had relied perhaps on the kindness of strangers here and there. He wasn't socially phobic in a way that prevented him from talking to strangers. As we know, that's how he met Maureen. She had the flu. Right. She was feeling very poorly. She kind of collapsed in the street while out, I think, trying to buy a radio, a stereo in uh, North London because uh, I think the, the concerts were on. She wanted to hear the last of those. And uh, so she ventured out, even though feeling very weak, had nothing to eat. Oh, all the day. proms. Yes. The proms, yes. I had yes. to look those up. Right. And, and what are those? It's an annual concert series like you right. were talking about, which I presume is still going on. Clearly some kind of tradition. Yeah. Yeah, she wanted to hear those. So that's that's why. And described as a very helpful, kind, generous person, very giving of his time. Yes. And from then, that relationship blossomed because he just kept showing up every day. He uh, he made her toast right. and, and a cuppa when he got home and he showed up the next day. And then that blossomed into them just helping out. Even after their relationship kind of faded away, she helped in his garden. So there was a lot of seeming closeness there that baffled Maureen because there wasn't any kind of falling out there. He just, like I said, I think that part of his personality was like, no, that chapter's done. It's easier not to say anything than say goodbye or have something drawn yeah. out, especially if he felt that she was, you know, emotionally attached. And I'm sure he was too in his own strange way. Uh, I just saw the term. I, I thought it was called a French exit, or that is a term for when you leave a party and don't announce it. My wife is famous for this, particularly in the circles that she works with right. people in in uh, Hollywood and stuff like that. And they call it an Irish goodbye. Ah, maybe it and is. I don't know the origin of that. I've only heard it from people. They they would come up to her and be like, Spivey, don't you do an Irish goodbye? <laughs> well, his, his point was that like, let's, uh, as our friend Glad said, like, let's cleanse ourselves get us to the tall corn and, you know, shed any kind of identification, break ties, just kind of close that off. And then I was thinking also, because, well, depending, I suppose, on how secular or observant his Jewish family was with his Jewish roots, him having an interest in these other religions, specifically Islam, may have caused a huge rift. They may have been very angry at him, or he did that out of a means to <laughs> go 180 degrees on yeah. his cultural and, and religious ties from his past, from his youth, and just say like, oh, and I'm done with that. I'm going to go completely the opposite direction and, and take up interest in this. And that will also uh, infuriate them perhaps and further cinch that off, that whole family relationship. So again, it's a lot of speculation because we, we really don't know, but the things are clear is that obviously he dealt with people and they know how he reacted to them. And those are some of the facts that we can deal with here and that just how he reacted, not what he was feeling so much, but just very oddly sequestering himself from other people in his life with each other. So yes, very compartmentalized, almost OCD, I think, in the way that he arranged things and just kept boundaries so precise and guardrails up so high that nothing ever touched. And something else I want to touch on again, which I mentioned earlier in the show, was this article in The Guardian where they dug up footage of... Mr. Lytton and his girlfriend, Maureen Too Good, at a wedding, uh -huh. dancing. And not just dancing, but walking around. And they and the footage is online. We have a link to that, as I already said. But when you watch it, it humanizes him. Because right, right. it's a lot of times you look at these stories and you're just like, well, it's, this is weird. This guy died and didn't have any ID and went and did all this weird stuff. But it's like, 
No, you watch that and you see like a clearly a shy, introverted man yeah. in that secondhand suit that Maureen said was the only thing he owned. It was like a secondhand suit along with, you know, his foam bed on the floor, which wasn't even a bed. It was a piece of foam. But you see them dancing very sweetly together. It's a nice moment at yeah. a wedding. And you can't help but feel bad for him because at least in that moment, you know, he seems like a, a relatively normal, for lack of a better right, word, right. not to label it, but you, you typical. Know, a, a regular, yeah. a typical individual. Yeah. And well, whatever it was that led him to his the, the end that he got to, it's a sad thing when you think about it, of course. One of the other things that's interesting about that is near the end of that clip, he walks right towards the camera and he looks away from it with body language that would be indicative of somebody that maybe had low self-esteem or was very shy. I, I think shy and very guarded about everything. On the other hand, as with the people very close to him, like Maureen, he didn't have a whole lot to divulge that, that she knew of or that we know of now. He may have had secrets that he was yeah. running from. But yeah. no one will ever know uh, because, again, I think he was very guarded with what he revealed, but also, and shy to some, but not everybody. He ate right. in the same vegetarian restaurant, as we said before, every night, didn't cook yes. at home, had no pots or pans, no fridge. <laughs> yes. So he ate every meal out. And so that involves dealing with people. And I understand that a little bit because I do love talking with people. I love talking with strangers even sometimes. But I also feel like when you're out in public and you just want to get something done, whether that's a haircut or you're at the grocery checkout, you yeah. just kind of want to get your business done. You yeah. know, you're polite, or I am, <laughs> but uh, you don't want to really engage. You just want to kind of get on with your business and do your chores. And yeah. eating at the same restaurant every night, well, you're going to get to know the wait staff very well. <laughs> I mean, this yeah, went on for that's years. True. That's true. And so yeah. you know how that is when they, uh, it's like cheers, like, hey, David. Yes. Yeah. And he's maybe had everything on the menu. I'd be curious to know what he ordered. Is it the same thing every time? Did he have the entire yeah. menu by that time? Right, right. These are all further clues into his personality, but you get to know people very well. I'm sure at that point, the manager is going to come out. The, the chefs are going to yeah. all know this guy and you get to know them. And so he's not that shy in some ways. And in others, he does seem to be a little social phobic. This is John Feskins. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Well, now we've gotten a picture of his life. I, I did want to mention the investigation did show that he had a passport that was issued on September 8th, right. 2006. And it had a 10-year expiration of September 8th, 2016, which was the year after he was found. So that's just a little information on his travel documents. But he obviously, if he got a passport, he was interested in going somewhere where he would need one. So there's been a suggestion all along in a lot of the police investigations and a lot of the articles that we read that everything that he did was a plan. He had a plan and he's right. executing the plan. And so maybe getting that passport was part of that. But then again, maybe it's just he wanted to be free to travel if he wanted to travel. Okay, so another thing that's interesting is that when he went to Pakistan, to Lahore, and he was in an area of Lahore called... Hassan Town, which is where he lived. They found his street address and everything. He had told his neighbors there that he had converted to Islam back in, I think it was 1996 or something. He had said that he had converted yeah. to Islam. But the police do not think that he necessarily actually did that. They could find no evidence that he had converted. So that's a question. One of his neighbors actually indicated in an interview that he may have just been saying that so that he wouldn't be separated out as right. a Christian or treated differently, because I guess they're you know not supposed to eat from the same pots, according to that one neighbor. But on the other hand, and we were talking to Glad about this, and we know, uh, or I should say, I can't speak for you, Forrest, but I know next to <laughs> nothing about Islam, and a I'm not, bit. Uh, yeah. I'm not pretending right. that I do, and I want to make that absolutely clear. But one of the things that Glad had pointed out to us about Islam is that you are to treat people with kindness. And if they sure. come into your home to eat, you they eat however they want. So maybe that reasoning doesn't make sense about why he would lie about that. But again, there's no proof of it. And just because he had a Quran, lots of people have Qurans and study religions. That doesn't mean that he had converted to Islam either. No, and he's not above uh, telling his neighbors uh, fibs about, uh, especially like going to moving to California to right. throw people off, to get them to There's back a little off. bit of a Walter Mitty, Secret Life of Walter Mitty situation going on here, um, right. which is one of my favorite, favorite short stories. And I also greatly enjoyed when the critics panned it, I think, uh, Ben Stiller's version oh. of the movie. <laughs> I kind of like to watch that every now and then oh. for escapism. Nice. But um, still, 
that's a really good point. He's telling lots of different people different things, not necessarily for nefarious reasons. Maybe he's just painting a fantasy life for himself or or different ideas of, I mean, moving to another country like that, um, and anyone who's traveled alone, which not everybody gets to do, but if you ever have, or you get somewhere, and maybe you're just out of town for business, or maybe you're you actually travel alone overseas or something from wherever you live. When you get there to some place you've never been before and you don't know anyone, I don't care who you are, that is a liberating feeling. It's well, a very, it's <laughs> yeah. exciting. It's like, I don't, I'm not going to bump into anybody here that I don't want to see. Of course, I'm right. not going to see anybody I do want to see either. But that's a, you know, it's an exciting like do over, at least to me, it's a do over. You're like, okay, I'm starting over. I'm going to do right. something exciting here or do whatever I want. No one knows me. I can be whatever I want to be. Right. And we're still not sure if he spoke the local languages or any of them. And so that could be further insulation from having to deal with people. But as we know, his neighbors took him in when he broke his leg. That's taking somebody into your house to care for them. They're eating your food. You're extending hospitality as per religious rules. And so he's accepted in a way, but we don't know how the rest of the community there reacted to him. This tall, skinny, white guy suddenly now in the neighborhood. And uh, was he singled out or poked fun at? Well, we do know that because one of his neighbors said that actually the local lads, in Ah, quote, would kind of pick on him. Apparently he was going for walks every day. He would go out in the morning in a track suit. So like, I mean, he may have been drawing some attention there. So maybe there was some bullying Another thing even I know about Islam is that suicide is a major sin in the Islamic faith, as it is with Catholicism. So it doesn't necessarily track in that way either. If he did, in fact, commit suicide, which the more and more you look into this story, the more it seems like that probably Hmm. is what it was. This doesn't seem like it's playing out like an international intrigue spy story or some criminal activity that led to this. It does seem a lot like suicide, but there's still some very major questions. But with regard to what his life was like there, I, yeah, I do think he would have stood out. And if there were the kind of people that didn't want to be welcoming to him, he certainly could have been a victim of, of a bullying or taunting or something else. And and coming back to, in terms of the neighbors and how he may have been treated, uh, both with hospitality and possibly in a negative way, the one neighbor in Pakistan, when they figured out that he had you know broken his leg, there was this family that took care of him. It was one of his neighbors and his kids were like bringing him food. They were bringing him pastries and fruit every day. He was on bed rest for 15 to 20 days. And when investigators asked what had happened, this person just said, well, he, he fell. He mm-hmm. took a fall and he broke his leg, which I, I believe it was his femur, if I remember correctly from the uh, x-ray. Yeah. Which is a bad break. That is uh, not something anybody it's wants to It's a big go bone through. and very painful. So he was laid up for that whole time and dependent on care of his neighbors because I think he was also somebody who would not accept or would want to take care of himself. So obviously he's needing uh, the help of others and accepted it because, uh, yeah, how is he going to walk to the store to get food or the market? And then uh, obviously not a big fan of making his own food. So he was dependent on others. I wonder if at that point he was laying on that foam on the floor with a broken leg and then, you know, the neighbor's kids are bringing him food. Yeah, It's very sweet of them to take care of him. But the other thing that's interesting is the neighbor said, well, he took a fall, which may be what he told the neighbor. But when the police investigators pulled the hospital records, which they finally tracked down relating to the surgery and the plate, which they had already known was installed for him in Pakistan, the records indicated that it seemed much more likely he had been in an altercation. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's not any details there, but I guess I would presume that that means there was maybe bruising or indication that something more had happened other than him just taking a fall. So here we have yet another unanswered question about how his leg got broken and why. So then we come back to the question of, you know, why, what was his disposition? Was he in fact depressed when this happened? And that's what led him to his untimely death. And Maureen Toogood, his girlfriend, who has also since passed away, she died in 2020, I believe. She had said back when she was talking to investigators about everything that she helped him get through a lot of depressive times. And, you know, they were together a long time. And of course, one of them was the miscarriage, which we already mentioned. And she had said plainly that after that, he was never the same. There was a part of him that had changed. And I guess that was probably his one chance at having children, or at least he thought it was. And so you could see where that might have been depressing to him. But in addition to that, when he was younger, he had gone to college and he had wanted to study sociology and psychology. And he signed up for classes at Leeds University to study that. But because of his hypothyroidism, which we mentioned before, 
he had issues that prevented him from getting good grades. If you listen to some of these symptoms for the National Health Service, uh, you can understand why. Uh, you have mood issues, anxiety, irritability, nervousness, hyperactivity and difficulty sleeping, fatigue, feeling tired all the time, sensitivity to heat, excess sweating and heat intolerance, increased appetite but unexplained weight loss despite that, frequent bowel movements, diarrhea, and excess fats in stool, muscle weakness, irregular or rapid heartbeat, heart palpitations, and pounding or racing heart, also a difficulty concentrating, hand tremor, restlessness, hair loss, and nail changes. So we don't know if he was suffering from all of these, but we do know from the investigations that he did suffer from the sleep problems, and that yeah. was a, an issue for him when he was at university at Leeds. He couldn't sleep at night. He was sleeping during the day and he started missing classes and he couldn't get the grades he wanted and he was unable, I guess, to pursue the degree that he wanted to get. So it's not clear whether he ever got it or not, right. but for whatever reason, I think he didn't excel. At the very least, he did not excel because of his sleep issues. Right. And I didn't line up all the differences between hypothyroidism, which is reduced function of the thyroid, and hyper or too much uh, function of the thyroid. But I think with both of them, at least the difficulty sleeping is a pronounced and common side effect with that condition. So yeah, he he just couldn't make it to class. He couldn't uh, function well. And so he was, uh, that the only time he could sleep was during the day. So that limits uh, that dream he had to pursue a higher degree in psychology and sociology. And so that kind of crushed his dreams. And then he ends up yeah. with a few other odd jobs, which I'm sure were satisfying. It sounds exciting to be a croupier. <laughs> yes, it does, <laughs> right? You know, working at uh, one of the casinos there. But, you know, he bounced around a little, so he was perhaps a little bit lost owing to this finding himself, not really settling yeah. in one career. He didn't get the thing he wanted. And uh, maybe that is somewhere else. And then towards the end, when you don't get exactly everything that you thought you should have, and then maybe later thought you didn't deserve then perhaps that was also a motivation for what he did. Yeah, that's a good point. And aside from being a croupier, he had also been a taxi dispatcher, right, right. a baker, yeah. and then intriguingly, a train driver on the London Underground. <laughs> right. And there's some speculation from investigators that that was where he had seen signs for the Peak District or the reservoirs uh, right. or Greenfield or something, because there was some sign up, a tourism sign that said, yeah. hey, come here to outside of Greater Manchester and visit right. this area. And maybe that's what drove him to the area, having been on the trains looking at these ads for several years. Yeah. But that's pure speculation, the purest form of speculation about why he went there, which to this day is not something that anyone knows. Uh, Maureen Toogood said very plainly, they didn't know anyone outside of London, really, yeah. and especially not up north. They knew nobody. And she didn't and he didn't. And she couldn't think of any reason why he would have gone up there. Right. And they still don't understand why he went up there. We'll talk about that more in our conclusions. But- fascinating. So now we end up with a list of mysteries, you could say, talking points about what he did, why and where. We know the how, mostly, I think. That's, well, they do know it was strychnine, but how did that get administered and who did it perhaps is still a, a lingering mystery. But let's take a look at a short list here of what we do know about. So what was the fight about that led to the name change? Do you know anything about that? No, we can't find anything anywhere on that. Jeremy never gave that up. I don't know if anyone ever asked him or it was personal or maybe it just wasn't fit for print or the police know, but they right. haven't shared it publicly. So we don't know what the great feud was within right. the family. It's possible that he was being unreasonable. Maybe it was about nothing much at all, yeah. but it just was something that triggered him to say, I'm done with everybody. Yeah. I'm changing my name. Goodbye. Right. So we don't have any idea there. Well, that he goes to Dubai for... You know, a short trip, a fair amount of time, four yes. days. That sounds more like vacation length, perhaps. We don't know. But still yeah. don't know why Dubai or know of anyone he knew in Dubai for any reason. Right. Did he travel with anyone? Did he travel to meet someone? Like what connection did he possibly have there? Or, you know, was it just a lark? Right, right. And then why did he move to Pakistan? Although he had not been to Manchester quite yet, I believe there's still a lot of Pakistani culture to be experienced in London as well, even though it's not uh, the central hub there. It is perhaps a way that he became familiar with it. It piqued his interest. Or a lot of times people will just have this romantic notion that they've read in books or seen in TV of a place that they want to visit. And there's, I don't know if it's a past life thing, but they, they desperately want to go there, even though they have no knowledge about it. 
I've certainly known people with that kind of condition who just know about a place and they just need to get there. They need to experience it. Having right. not been there before or had any connection to it, they just knew about it. So the Pakistani connection, well, it, it was certainly more than just a fleeting fancy because he lived there for so long and was immersed in it. But yeah, you could have been exposed to a lot of the elements of that culture just from being in England. Yeah. So maybe he went there out of intrigue. Maybe it had to do with his interest in other religions, but that's still a mystery. Why did he go to Pakistan? Another mystery is, did he kill himself? And the more we look at this and the more the details unfold, and we're going to talk about the whole timeline of his last days here in a minute. But the question remains, if he actually was responsible for his own death, did he die of suicide? It seems that way. Yeah. The more I look at this case, the more that seems like what has happened here. There were no other nefarious characters that he bumped into. The, everyone who ever saw him, all the witnesses, the CCTV camera, everything, he was alone. It wasn't like he met someone or somebody saw him going up the mountain with somebody else or he was seen rendezvousing with somebody up there, which, you know, yes, it's a park, it's spread out, but it's also seems like it's fairly busy. So that wouldn't be the best place to do that anyway, because there's a lot of people visiting it every yeah. day. Mm. So I don't think we can say that he didn't die of suicide. And that's even what the police have said. But interestingly, it's an open conclusion, according to one of the articles of the BBC. It is not a sewed up case. And we'll talk more about what that means here in a few minutes. That is another one of the big questions. So if he did die of suicide, the next question, of course, is why? And a lot of times you don't have any idea why somebody would do that. Other times you have suicide notes. There are cases with them and cases without them. And the other thing that was fascinating is that in the BBC podcast, one of the things I think that uh, Detective Sergeant Coleman said was, it's not unusual for someone who has died of suicide not to have any identification on them. Right. That's a conscious choice that is made frequently, apparently. So we've been talking with our friend Paul Gledhill, or Gledders as we call him, or Gled. We mentioned him several times in this episode and also in part one. He is retired from Scotland Yard. He is also going back to school right now, working on his Master of Arts degree, which he is currently studying for, in psychodynamics. So he has a unique perspective of having formerly been a police investigator and then also taking a look at the psychological components of what might be going on in a case like this. And one of the things that he had said is interesting about someone who maybe has died of suicide without any identification on them is that it might be a form of punishing people in their lives. They're like They want it to be an open question as to what happened to them, to send a message back to their relatives. So maybe that was something that David Litton did to stick in the craw of his brother or his mother, although his mother was has been suffering from dementia for quite some time, which I would think he would know. And that's another interesting point that we'll touch on when we get to the timeline here. I don't know whether or not that was the case here, whether or not he was trying to make it harder to figure out who he was, because paradoxically, if you were doing that, then you wouldn't necessarily think he would lie down right on the side of a popular hiking trail. Everything brings up more questions. And then we come down to the strychnine, which we've mm -hmm. mentioned as well. It's like a, such a horrible, painful way to go. This is technically a biotoxin. You're taking a biotoxin and that was what was found, again, in the thyroxine bottle that he had on him, which would have been a treatment for his hypothyroidism. So he had the strychnine in there, which he would be able to legally purchase in Pakistan as a rodenticide at that time. Mm -hmm. It was not available in the EU. It had been outlawed. So he would have had to get that in Pakistan and then travel with it. Interestingly, I'm surprised. I, you know, I don't have any idea how he managed to get through with that, but maybe they just, oh, that's thyroxine. They didn't know what it was. Maybe it looks similar. In the well, bottle. yeah, if it's, especially if it's in a, yeah, prescription bottle. Yeah, it's in a prescription bottle. So, but here's the interesting thing about the strychnine, something we mentioned before, and it now is as good a time as any to talk about that. It's, it's a horrible way to go. You're likely to have seizures mm -hmm. and you're probably going to suffocate. So why did he look like he had just laid down to take a rest on the side of the trail? Why wasn't he more contorted? Yeah, it's one of the biggest questions I have still, maybe the biggest one, because yeah. it's odd in that, well, why take a poison? Again, we speculated earlier that it may have just been available to him. Maybe he didn't know all the side effects of strychnine poisoning or just thought like, well, this will do. Or it's what I deserve, this yeah. horrible end. That's exactly. what's suited for me. Or, you know, as... Glad also said, there are a lot of other beauty spots closer to him that he could have just jumped off a cliff, you know, at a nice, lovely spot and have it end instantaneously. 
hitting right. the rocks or right. people have uh, different choices for what they see as a fitting end to themselves. And he maybe just thought like, well, I can sit on the side of this hill or get to the top of this mountain. And, you know, again, maybe not knowing exactly what he was in for, just like, well, I'll just take poison. I'll fall asleep. It'll be fine. The last thing I'll see is this lovely spot, but there are other quicker means to have done that. And also just as lovely scenic spots to have your last looks at. So right. it's just odd. There's some connection there. Or like I said, just somehow they got stuck in his head like that needs to happen there. But then you do wonder, does it need to be more than that? Is there some significance that we're not catching here about that location that he didn't seem to be familiar with? So we right. do know that. And uh, what's the draw of that place rather than someplace you've been to and uh, have come to know and you're familiar with it and you know it's just as lovely and a lot easier. Right. And another thing that Gled said that I thought was fascinating, though, was that Manchester and Greater Manchester has a very, very large pronounced Pakistani community. Right, right. So, which is not something we would know because we've not been there. So um, that was an interesting point. It, it could be that he heard about this area from somebody yeah. in Pakistan where right. he was living. And maybe someone said, you know, you should go here. You should go see this. Right. Maybe it was a passing conversation. Maybe it was his neighbor that nursed him back to health when he broke his leg. And they didn't have any idea that he was looking for a destination. Now, when he got there, he essentially went straight to this place. Yeah. He didn't spend a lot of time in Manchester trying to connect with the Pakistani community. And he just went out to the park, right. the Peak District National Park, and made his way up the mountain by way of the Clarence Pub. Straight away. And everybody's bodies react differently. And he may not have had the contortion and the the writhing around in agony that other victims of strychnine poisoning have, he may have been a, a little quieter, but he was posed in such a way that it, it just seems too peaceful. And so the other thing I thought yeah. of, and, and Glad mentioned this as well, is that perhaps somebody had positioned him back from right. being sprawled out. They just came by, as you said, it's remote, but it's not unvisited quite a bit by outdoor enthusiasts. And somebody could have been uh, walking by who didn't want to get involved and just saw this guy right. sprawled out and uh, decided to put him back into a peaceful repose on the side of the hill. Although that seems also a little, maybe more far-fetched too. I think most people yeah, would react like the I cyclist don't... and like, okay, there's a guy sprawled out here. He seems deceased. Well, I should call it somebody. It depends on who comes by. Right. I mean, you know, you're walking around people all the time. You don't know. You could be like in a crowd of people. You may be with somebody who's killed someone or done well, it that's, that's and also, got away with it yep. or been around bodies before. Yep. Or just an outstanding warrant. They don't want to be on record uh, yeah. and get involved. And exactly. So. so they come by, they go over, they check him out. There's nothing to do for him. But he looks ghastly, so they cross his arms and maybe close his eyes. And because it's another thing that Gled asked me when I was talking to him about this, like, what do you think happened here? He goes, what? He said, Scott, have you ever seen a dead body? And I said, you know, actually, no, I haven't uh, in, in a case like this anyway, mm -hmm. beyond car accidents or something that you drive by. And he, having been with Scotland Yard, has seen several, of course. And he said, the face they have is the face they had in the moment of death. Right. And had it been the strychnine poisoning, you would think that he would have been contorted or aghast or had some ghastly look on his face. Yeah. So he too thought it was very unusual that he seemed at peace and almost as if he was resting. So to me, it makes sense that maybe somebody did come by and... Rather than call it in or call the police, they, for spiritual reasons of their own, mm -hmm. they decided, well, this is done. We need to make this right for him so that when he's found, he has some dignity or something to that effect. And they did that. Uh, I don't know. I, either yeah. that or he was a master of ignoring pain. And this, another thing Glad said is maybe the toxicology missed a secondary medication that he took to reduce the discomfort of the strychnine. That's also a possibility. But if you look at him being manipulated either out of doing a kind gesture so you're not found all askew, uh, which is weird, okay? <laughs> it's, just, it's just weird yeah. to kind of do that. Or it's foul play in right. some way that, uh, as we know, some murders take place and the body is repositioned. So where, however the, uh, the killer thought they should look or be found because they know right. they're going to be found. That's how they want them to be found. That's also very strange. So we don't know if he had help, perhaps, either just with ending his life or somebody came by or he was meeting somebody and there's a little bit of uh, foul play going on. 
another side thing I mentioned as well is that it's said uh, within the Japanese culture of, for somebody who is going to take their own life to sometimes bind themselves oh, right. in a manner that uh, they know that when they'll be found, it'll be a more graceful pose. Uh, so they they prevent that and that they know they're going to be found and they they want to look good. They want to, It's that old yeah. leaving a good looking corpse kind of thing. But that's Japanese culture, I've heard. And in this case, it's just maybe for me the biggest weird clue. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, uh, what we do know is that it was a long ways to go to do that. 4,000 yeah. mile flight, yeah. eight hours from Lahore to Heathrow. Yeah. A lot of time to sit and reflect if he was just sitting there thinking about this, a lot of time to change your mind, but obviously he had his mind made up or he did not know yeah. what he was heading towards. Well, also there are some extenuating circumstances that may have meant that he didn't have a choice. He knew that he wouldn't at least, at the very least, right. be able to return to Pakistan. Good point on that. And in one more interesting aspect of people who try to take their own lives, uh, and I find it kind of inspiring in a way that people who survive it most often don't try it again. Right. I find that to be interesting in that you're so determined to go to these means and end everything. And if you survive it, it, it jolts you with a new reawakened sense of purpose in life that uh, they often don't try to get, no matter how messed up you are from the attempt. There's a really good podcast episode, uh, I think from NPR, I don't know if it's from KCRW locally or if it's This American Life, but it's a story on several people who have tried. One guy jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and lived. I, I think it was some tall bridge, if not that one. And he was, uh, he was pretty messed up, but it fused him with a, a renewal for a lust of life. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Elizabeth Clark. Now back to the show. Okay, so we just want to touch on the timeline of his travel again, just to get this big picture as we get near the end of this series. This timeline comes to us from a BBC article, which we'll have a link to, and it details everything that police investigators were able to determine about how he got from Pakistan to the side of the Chew Trail at the Dovestone Reservoir. So on Thursday, December 10th, 2015, at 10.30 in the morning, he boards a Pakistan International Airways plane in Lahore heading to London. And that's the flight uh, 757 we told you about, which was a 777 aircraft, very nice aircraft. He's in seat 25C. He lands at Heathrow at 3.30 p.m. and is met by a friend that he had known for several decades, an old friend. So they have dinner together at the airport. And then that evening, he checks into a travel lodge in Ealing Broadway and books a room for five days. Mm -hmm. So remember that. He's booking a room for five days. So it's like, is he still covering his tracks? What's going on right. here? And there's no indication of what he talked to that guy about at dinner. I'm sure the police know, but I couldn't find that anywhere. I would yeah. love to know what that discussion was. And in fact, but there's no indication of what that guy's name is. There's no way to find that out right now. My um, mysterious maybe, dinner with Andre. Yeah. I'm going to make a note here because it'd be interesting to try to find that person. Uh, perhaps. Yeah. And yeah. a friend of 35 years, I think. And so it also yeah. goes to show that he could maintain long-term right. friendships. And in this case, we're not sure how often he'd connected with this person, but obviously enough to go uh, to the airport and have dinner if you live in LA, you have to be a pretty good friend for somebody to go meet you at the airport. For, <laughs> yes. It's such a, yeah. a, yeah, a that's pain right. to get there. But yeah, it's uh, a pain. I'm sure it's yeah. easier. Here. No, <laughs> Unless I, you live right there. <laughs> right. You're close by. <laughs> Which Nobody I did for to. years. I lived yeah. right next to LAX. So uh, that, was, right. that was okay. But that was almost a curse because then people are like, I know you're right there. Come meet me. Oh, at the gate. You know, yes. Whatever, it's like owning a pickup. Then everybody asks you to help them move. So yeah. in this case, it's somebody that they've known a long time. Yeah, you know, we don't know that discussion. I'm sure that wasn't brought up. And, but what's yeah. also odd is that he's not going to need this room for five days unless right. maybe he was going to kind of mull things over. That's the other thing that Glad said, too, about the uh, the round trip ticket. Yeah. He said, that's just a British thing. He goes, we always get that. Yo, it's only a dollar more. You right. just, get, just in case you might have just to come case. back. Well, no, that makes sense. He goes, sense. that's a British thing. It's yeah. not that unusual. Right. But with the hotel, five days, that's a pretty big commitment mm. to say, oh, you know, I'm, I might be back here. So maybe this is a window into his mindset. Maybe he hadn't made up his mind yet. Maybe right. he was still feeling all this stuff out or he was he was prepared to back out or he was might be a little afraid to I go know through with it. He figures that he's not going to need his cash. So, you know, go ahead and 
spend it. Uh, he didn't get that lavish with uh, his other expenditures on the travel there, as we know from CCTV and receipts. Uh, right. You know, just having an airport sandwich, an yeah. M&S sandwich, didn't really buy any knickknacks. Well, what's he going to need them for later? But obviously, it just sounds like somebody who's serious about getting to their destination rather than just kind of lounging around. Right. And, but the five days is, is very odd. Did he right. expect to return and yeah. need a room when he came back? Or was he going to spend the whole five days there mulling it over and then on the last day check out and then check out for good? I mean, that's the thing. So that was Thursday, December 10th, 2015. The next morning, Friday at 9.04 a.m. on the 11th, he paid four pounds and 80 cents cash for a single ticket at Ealing Broadway Station, which is right there, and gets on the tube. Then at 9.50 a.m., he's at Houston Station, where he pays 81 pounds and 60 cents cash for an off-peak return ticket to Manchester. The train departs at 10 a.m., stopping at Stoke-on-Trent, Macclesfield, and Stockport along the way. At 12.07, he arrives on Platform 6 at Manchester Piccadilly. At the station, he visits a gambling arcade, a Boots, a W.H. Smith, and buys an M&S, Marks and Spencer sandwich, right. as you said. Right. And at 1 p.m., he leaves Manchester Piccadilly Station, so he spent about an hour there, on foot towards the city center. Now, there's a gap in the timeline here. The police call it the missing 59 minutes. They don't know how he got from the station right. to a pub 12 miles away in less than an hour. Yeah, somebody obviously gave him a ride. I don't think he biked there. And then at 2 p.m., that's when he walks into the Clarence Pub in the village of Greenfield. And now he's close to Saddleworth Moore. And this is at the point yes. where he asks the manager, the uh, landlord of the pub, Melvin Robinson, for, quote, directions to the top of the mountain, which he gives yes. him. By the way, some of these articles say that he asked to go to Wimberry Stones, which is specifically actually the crash site of the DC-3 crash we talked about. Right. Also known as Indian Head to locals right, there. right, right. right which, by the way, is also the name of the stone where Betty and Barney saw their UFO, also called Indian Head. Of course, there's probably a million <laughs> mountains called Indian well, Head. Yes. But from what I can tell, it's like, I don't think he asked, when you see the interviews with Melvin, it's like he didn't say anything about Wimberry Stones. He said the phrase, top of the right, mountain. Right, right. Yeah. It, and so, but later people were trying to connect it to the DC-3 crash uh, and, oh, he was going to the crash site or whatever. Right. From what we could see, it was just like, how do I get to the top of the mountain? Which he asked Melvin twice about, I guess. Yeah, he had to get the directions uh, again because obviously it points to him not being familiar at all or having done much of any research, maybe just knowing the name and uh, some yeah. very cursory directions to get to the spot and had to ask for it. So it's not like he totally planned this out with a bunch of maps and Google Earth. Uh, he just kind of got himself in the area and asked directions for the rest of the way. And I'm not even sure if he knew that that, uh, that chew track was the spot. I think maybe perhaps he was just kind of wandering around or maybe he didn't know the name of that, but basically it's not how to get to chew track. It's how to get to the top of the mountain, which is pretty vague. Right. Exactly. Well, at this point now being a winter day, uh, 4 PM, the sun is, uh, setting across the moor. It is a little bit remote. It's not that easy to get to, but there are people around there. That's when he passes two RSPB members walking down from the mountain as he's going up. And yes. this is the last known sighting of him while alive. Yes. And again, for folks who don't remember, RSPB, I believe, is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Yes. Yeah. There are birders. Yes. Uh, they're ending their day. I think they find it a little odd that he seems to be going up. And also when it's about to get dark, which you don't want to be stumbling around out there in the dark. I think Melvin said it was raining sideways, or at least maybe the next day when they found him, it was. The weather was horrible yeah. or about to be horrible. And he was not, as we said before, he was not dressed for the occasion. Right. They wondered if he was lost or something, but, uh, you know, it's, it's his own business. They just let him be. Right. Well, the next entry in this timeline, and perhaps the last, is Saturday, December 12th, 1047 a.m., and that's when cyclist Stuart Crowther discovers David's body on the moor. And so then he calls the police, as he should, and it gets entered into the incident log as uh, event number 936 and just reads... Male deceased found in local beauty spot. Yeah. Okay. Which, uh, again, they're calling it a beauty spot. It doesn't seem very technical, but uh, that's the area. That's the entry. And that's all they know at this point, which would lead to the rest of this mystery. Oh, yes. And by the way, one thing that he apparently did tell the friend he had dinner with at the airport was that he wanted to tour the countryside. He did ah, tell yeah. him that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like, right. Yeah. 
But this brings me to the email that we got uh, day before yesterday from James Coppert, who we've actually talked about on the show yeah, before. Yeah. But this is an interesting email, but we wanted to share this with you, and he gave us permission to do that. Good evening, Forrest and Scott. Just listened to the new episode. That would be last week's part one on this. Awesome as always. The first thing to note is how close this is to the Todd Morton Adamski case geographically. Ooh, that that is weird. Yeah, so he didn't give distance there, but I did look it up. It is uh, about 20 miles from yeah. Todd Morton. Dovestone is 20 miles north and slightly west of Todd Morton. But the Adamski case that we covered recently about the man found dead on the pile of coal. You might remember that if you listened. And I know 20 miles is a long way in England. Don't yes, it is. Up it that is. <laughs> argument again. So James goes on to say, I do the Fortean News podcast and Confessions of a Ghost Boy channel. And you may or may not know, I do a lot of collating stories and folklore from the Moors here in the North. And like my friend, Paul Sinclair, Ooh. also spend a lot of time investigating the area. In fact, to my girlfriend's disdain, I was on the North Yorkshire Moors this Saturday investigating an area after I received reports despite meant to be resting from surgery. If someone reports something to me, I have to get out there no matter what. I even investigate the Moor and Forest solo at night. After all, I also stayed solo at East Drive all night as well, which isn't too far from this spot either. Mm -hmm. So again, for our listeners, the North Yorkshire Moors National Park is about 72 miles northeast of the Peak District National Park, where Dovestone is. And Pontefract is only 45 miles east and slightly north of Dovestone. And what he's referring to there, East Drive, that's Pontefract. Yeah. That's from our series, uh, The Black Monk of Pontefract, which is a really great uh, story. If you haven't heard it, check it out. But yeah, so he went and stayed there. Pretty cool. He goes on to say, I want to give you a little background into what the Moors are like. These are areas that are vast and isolated, but at the same time have been lived on since prehistoric times. These are ancient places. The people that live here now are still traditional and steeped in tradition and magical thinking. It has been documented even in the past 100 years of magical wise women and men in each village who would perform spells. There are stories of the hills and valleys being carved by giants and dragons, and also the legends of the people who killed them, who can be traced to real people. There are also vast numbers of Bronze Age monuments, burial mounds, and druid circles, so many that they're not even signposted. And then he sent a link to a map, which we'll uh, we'll share in our show notes, where you can click on any of the Moorland sites, and you cannot believe how many historical monuments there are. It's like you can't see the streets or any of the features underneath the map because there's so many markers for things that have been found. He continues, this is also an area for the Fae, boggles, and mysterious lights, as well as tragedy. If you look at UFO sightings, you will also see a correlation of clusters over the Pennines and North Yorkshire Moors. So I had to look up what a boggle was. Uh, here, mm. that's a game from the 70s with <laughs> dice in right. a plastic box. A bogle, boggle, or bogill, B-O-G-I-L-L, this is from Wikipedia, is a Northumbrian, Cumbrian, and Scots term for a ghost or folkloric being used for a variety of related folkloric creatures, including Shelley Coates, Barguest, Braggs, and Headley Cow, and even giants such as those associated with Cobb's Causeway. Oh, yeah. They are reputed to live for the simple purpose of perplexing mankind rather than seriously harming or serving them, which I, I like perplexing <laughs> us. Uh, so that's what those are for folks that didn't know. And uh, forgive us, those of you in the UK who know what all of that is and are mad about the way that I pronounced a bunch of it. Talking about the Moors again here, we're yeah. going back to James's letter. If you haven't been to them, they can only be described as being a strange juxtaposition of being both breathtakingly beautiful and immensely bleak at the same time. It does feel like there is magic around you and you can be stood with a view for miles around you, not see another soul and yet never truly feel alone. Then there are the frets or fogs that suddenly appear and roll over the hills, sometimes taking the form of something as well as being the places where the bar guests roam, even with people genuinely believing they have seen them recently. If you require any more information about the area, please do give me a shout. Many kind regards. Keep up the great work. Much love, James. And then he sent a follow-up note, and he said, I forgot to add, it's near Pendle, where the witch trials Ooh, were yeah. held mm. as well. So we shared a link from James Coppert on the show when we did uh, Mrs. Hingley and the Mince That's Pie right. Martians yes. that episode. He had a video that we about Christmas, uh, British Christmas Mince Pie. That's where we posted show it. Links there. Yeah, we did. Yes. And uh, if you want to check out his show, just uh, thank you so much, James, for sending us in. We really appreciate it and letting us read it. Um, his show, again, is called The Fortean News Podcast, and, in, and he recommended an episode for everyone to listen to called The Witches of the North York Moors. 
where he did an interview with Rosie Barrett. Uh, Rosie Barrett is from the Rydale Folk Museum, and she shares some of the history and folklore around many of the wise women who lived in the North Yorkshire Moors. Explore their stories and lives as well as listening to some of the other amazing folklore from the area, from giants to dragons. That is on his show, the Fortean News Podcast. We'll have a link to that episode in our show notes. And again, James, thank you for sending that in. So coming back to a motivation possibly for why David might have left Pakistan and then also why he didn't make plans to return. In the investigation, once they figured out who he was, they uncovered some information about his visa. Folks who haven't traveled internationally may not understand the difference between a visa and a passport. A passport verifies your identification. That's a government-issued document. A visa is an official document that allows you to legally enter a foreign country. It's usually stamped or glued into your passport. The destination country's embassy, consulate, or immigration authority issues visas, which grant you permission to enter the country for a specific purpose and period of time. There are different types of visas, such as tourist, student, work, and diplomatic visas. You might need one if you're traveling for a specific purpose, such as work or study, or some countries require you to apply for one in advance. Whether or not you need a visa depends on where you're going and where you're coming from, what your country of citizenship is, the country you're visiting, and the purpose of your travel. Most countries don't require visas from citizens of economically developed, stable, and democratic countries because they aren't seen as potential illegal immigrants. But in this case, David Litton needed a visa to go to Pakistan, and his visa was set to expire in 2015. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it would have been December 15th, 2015, five days after he left the country to return to London. So what they found when they were investigating him was that back in November of 2008, there had been some problems with the visa and he wound up tampering with it or had it tampered with yeah, and he got busted. Yep, yep. And he went to a Pakistani jail Ooh. for five days. Mm. Now for a guy like this, shy, introverted, probably jail in Pakistan, not his favorite place in the world. That might've freaked him out pretty bad. And well, I'll bet at least the mattress was better than the one he was using. Yeah, that's probably true. But what's interesting about all of this is that his permission to stay in Pakistan was basically set to expire on December 15th of 2015. So he left on December 10th. And I think it's plausible that possibly he felt like if he didn't get out, he could get in trouble again, wind up back in jail. But the other problem is, is after he had the issues with the visa, it seemed unlikely that he would get one to return. So he was on a deadline to leave the country is what it sounds like right. to me. Right, yes, and, I think so too. And I think that's also interesting. By the way, I want to come back to the 39-pound suitcase you mentioned right, right. that he left the country with and has not been found. So we don't know what was in that. So the visa, that could be what led him not to return. And again, we were talking to Gled about this and he said, well, yeah, but he doesn't have to go back to Pakistan. There's all kinds of other places he could go. There's places he could go in England. There's other countries he could probably get into easier. So when I look at the big picture here, the visa does seem like the impetus for him to leave the country. But what is it that took him all the way up there to commit suicide by taking strychnine on the mountain? And that part, I'm not sure about. I mean, he comes back in, he goes, he meets with an old friend, he has dinner, tells him he wants to tour the countryside, and then he goes to a place he's never been before, theoretically. I mean, we wouldn't know if he'd been there before, honestly. He was pretty good at keeping secrets. Maybe it was a place that he did know. For some other, he could add a whole nother secret life or activity that happened there, brief or prolonged, and we wouldn't know about it because Maureen clearly didn't know everything he was up to. His family, he was estranged from, seemed like he was doing lots of things on his own. The question becomes, what made him feel like that was the end for him? And when you look back at his life, and, and we all have depressing events that have happened in our lives, but when you look back at his life and the bigger picture, you know, not being able to pursue what he wanted to do academically because of his hypothyroidism, uh, the miscarriage in his relationship with Maureen and the falling out with his family, which actually made him so upset that he changed his name and fled the country. He gave Maureen, although vicariously, or maybe it was just that he gave, because the, the neighbor gave the information to Maureen that he was going to California. Maybe he was just lying to that neighbor about right, going right. to California. And then that neighbor told Maureen he went to California. Either way, he sold the house without telling Maureen right. and he went to Pakistan. And he obviously didn't tell his family either. They didn't know he was in Pakistan either. So in all of that big picture, then he gets into trouble there. He gets in trouble with the visa. He decides to come back. And now he is going 
up to the top of the mountain outside of Greenfield, and he's taking strychnine and laying down. The biggest question again for me is why wasn't he in a more contorted state mm -hmm. when he was found? Mm -hmm. I think that's honestly the biggest question of the case. And the other thing that's interesting is that when you listen to the BBC podcast series, at the end of it, they state that the coroner declared that it was an open conclusion. That means that the police think it's suicide, but they're not really sure. And what's interesting about that is, I, you know, I was talking to Gled about this, and he explained that over there, the coroner works very differently from how it works in the United States. It's actually a judge who is medically trained. It's not a person that does any cutting or autopsies right, or right. whatever. This is somebody who is supposed to evaluate what's happened and come to a conclusion. And the conclusion in this case was that it's open, which means you could come back to it and have a ruling about whether it's a suicide or a homicide or not. But they didn't definitively call it a suicide either. So what happened to David Litton that led him to this end? And why was it so hard to figure out who he was? And when I personally look at the big picture of his lifestyle, and like I said, all the compartmentalization and the, and the clandestine activity, which he seemed to just be doing because it was part of his personality, it's fascinating to me. I think there's a lot of people out there that have unusual lifestyles, that there's a lot of things about the way he was living that might be familiar to them. And it doesn't mean that they're in his particular scenario. And as I said before, I have a friend that lives a very minimalist, right, right, aesthetic right. lifestyle like this, a close friend, and he's fine with it. And that's fine to each his own. Everybody gets to do yeah. what they want. And if they if they want to be clandestine and, mm -hmm. and compartmentalized in their lives, they get to do that. But what was it about David Litton that led him to this untimely end? Yeah. And why was it so hard to figure out who he was? And how come we still don't know exactly what happened? Well, let's break that down then, because there are several elements to that. If you look at all the personality quirks, yeah, that leads to perhaps why, maybe where, and I may be wrong about this, but I think on the legal stance or the uh, the police administrative stance here, if you look at, you have to determine the cause of death. So there's either he took his own life or somebody helped him with that, <laughs> you know, helped him along. Somebody took his life. Yes. Here, we it's clear that we have the two things. Now, if you watch a lot of true crime, you'll know that often in these cases, something that seems so obviously like foul play gets listed as suicide. And it's baffling. And it's like, really? The person stabbed themselves 20 times? Maybe that's possible. <laughs> but is there something else going on here that uh, it just doesn't seem logical? In this case, like, well, there doesn't seem to be that much indication of, like, say, a struggle, torn clothes, something nefarious, really, but we still don't know. So I'm wondering if there are clues that the court has not released yet that the public just doesn't know about, or any reporters for that matter, or that right. the police know about? Is there something else that makes them think that this is not totally wrapped up as a suicide? Right. What is making them keep that open? Now, the attitude a lot of times, as we'll see here, depends on the judge, depends on the people officiating, and, and really comes down to the court and the judge and how they rule on uh, what they think makes sense at the time. And the coroner report, obviously, here in the United States, everything's uh, relied upon. And, and as you'll see in big, famous cases here, notorious ones, that sometimes people will hire an independent forensic examiner because they don't trust the, what the state is going to do. You'll see that in kind of like high-profile cases. So here, what I'm wondering is like, okay, you, then you separate all the quirky stuff that he did from that because it doesn't matter then why he got up there. Then you're looking at really, is this a crime? And what is it about what they found during the autopsy, the forensic uh, technicians found, that makes the medical examiner or the British equivalent wonder why this isn't completely a closed case? Right. As we learned from the Somerton man, the medical examiner, who was no slouch, uh, I think was a professor of uh, pharmacology at Melbourne, was saying that this definitely looks like poisoning to me, even wrote down on a piece of paper and showed it to uh, the judge, I believe, uh, what he thought that poison could be that could be untraceable, at least after a certain amount of time, would dissipate in the body. But the fact is that there was no doubt to him that this was a murder. This man had been poisoned, or he had poisoned himself. So here now you have very similar things. Man found in repose, lying down like he's taking a nap in a uh, much more secluded area on the moor, but a public place where people go to recreate. 
And turns out, well, at least it's definitely a poisoning by strychnine. And in the Summerton Man case, still not sure, but the medical examiner was pretty convinced that that was the case. So you still have the mystery in both cases. Did the Summerton Man and did David Litton take their own life or did somebody help them with that? So I will go along with it was probably him taking his own life. On the other hand, there's still enough weirdness to this that it's not a totally open and shut case with me because as the rest of his living life and quirks and personality points out, there's room for a lot of weirdness, a lot of things that don't make sense. And so why wouldn't his end also not make sense? Why would there also be strangeness to it? And so we may never know until uh, some more evidence comes forward. Sometimes human behavior is just strange and it's not going to make sense to the rest of us. And that's just where it's meant to be, where everybody does things that other people wouldn't understand for their own reasons. Well, we're going to wrap this show up with a quote from Maureen Toogood, his ex-girlfriend who has since passed away, God rest her soul, in 2020. But she told the BBC the following when she was asked what her final view on things were. I'm glad he's found his resting place, but I'm sorry for me. At least I had a chance that one day he'll knock at the door. I shall miss him greatly. He was a lovely man. That's going to wrap up episode 290 of Astonishing Legends. We're dark for two weeks, but after that, we'll be back to our regular year-round bi-weekly schedule. Find and subscribe to the other shows from the Astonishing Legends Network, The Midnight Library, Scared All the Time, and Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. We have links to all of them in our show notes. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vocola, or as we call him, The Mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. First name spelled R as in Robert. Hi, I'm John Feskins. D as in David. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Clark. A as in Apple. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. J-O-H-N-F-E-H-S-K-E-N-S. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Caressia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at DeadStreetProductions.com. Many episodes have transcripts available. For ones that don't, you can request them by emailing transcripts at AstonishingLegends.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at AstonishingLegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to commercial-free versions of the show and additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, The Astonishing Junk Drawer. If you're new to Patreon, you can save money by signing up on the web through a browser or using an Android device rather than Apple's App Store, where Apple is now charging a 30% markup on signups through iOS. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>